on anything that was covered by our two previous presenters, please come on down to the microphones. And uh, since we've got nobody there, uh, I'm going to check to see uh, if uh, <coughs> we can get uh, some online questions. I know that the microphone is making it its way back to you so that we can ask the online questions. Um, there we go. Ray, please kick it off with our first online question. Uh, this question was directed to Janice. Under the new definition of biological product, am I understanding correctly that any product that contains protein, according to the definition and a reference page 8, will be a, will be a biologic or is it a protein that is classified as an active ingredient, I'm sorry, inactive ingredient, then this is not the case. Thank you for the question. If a product contains a protein as an inactive ingredient or an excipient, for example, a product is formulated in albumin, then it would not fall within the agency's interpretation of the term protein uh, for purposes of meeting the statutory definition of a biological product. Thank you, Andrew Chen from Novo Nordics. Thank you very much for the two excellent presentations, and I'm glad Susan is on the panel as well. My question is related to facility for the transition product. Is there any different expectation on facility for the transition product after March 23rd, 2020? Can you elaborate a little bit more about what you mean by, by different expectations of the facility? I mean, the facility should all be under GMPs. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't think we don't have different GMP expectations. Uh, we follow ICHQ7, and um, ICHQ7 is not specific for NDAs or BLAs. It's specific for um, biotechnology products. So I think, you know, if you can look at the, the expectations under ICHQ7, um, which we have all already looked at as it applies to, to biotechnology products. Yeah, uh, that's the answer I wanted. <laughs> so you already answered, but I want to get a clarification from you directly. Thank you. All righty, and again, if there's any questions in the room, please come on up to the microphones. But let's go to our next online question, please. Is the lot release requirement meant for the commercial product once the BLA is approved or does this apply to the application stability lots or validation batches? The lot release program applies to lots that are going to be released to the market. And because that was an online question, that was the perfect answer. All right, again, any questions in the room? Come on up to the mics, but let's go with our next online question, please, right? Dr. Rosado mentioned that validation data must be included in a BLA submission, whereas it was not required for an NDA. Could you comment on other data that will be needed for a BLA that was not needed in an NDA, including requirements for submitting facility information? So the data uh, is not necessarily different uh, what we expect. The only, the main difference is that for a BLA or a supplement to a BLA, that data, the process validation data, for example, has to be submitted in the supplement uh, prior to approval versus uh, for NDAs, which sometimes that data will be made available before commercial uh, distribution. So that's that's the main difference. All righty. Ray, you got another one back there for me? Can you describe additional information the FDA expects in distribution reports for biological products? 
Um, it's actually very clearly described in the regs. And yeah, so I can give you uh, the reference. So for biological products, uh, 21 CFR 600.81, and for uh, NDAs, 21 CFR 314.81. Um, and it basically includes additional uh, information related to uh, the label lot number, the date of release of the lot, if there was any significant amount uh, of a field or, or a lot that was uh, returned and, and why, which is a little bit different than the requirements for distribution reports for uh, NDAs. Okay, and I, I saw from the signal in the back, we've got one more online question. How do BPDRs review and handling differ from FARs? So it's not so much, um, so once the BPDR or FAR gets to the reviewer, they apply the same principles of review, uh, scientific principles to the review. The process for submitting FARs and BPDRs to FDA is different. The FARs come in through, get submitted to the field office, and BPDRs get submitted to the center. Um, so the difference tends to be more in, in the management and the flow of information. But the scientific principles, um, we, we apply the same scientific principles to biotechnology products, um, no matter how, how the information flows to us. All right. And that is all the questions that we've got so far. Please help me thank our panel for speaking to us in their presentations. And panels, you can just hang out here for a second. I'm going to invite back up the man who helped kick us off with one of the keynotes at the outset. Dr. Mike Kopsha was one of the key figures in pulling together this entire program with SBIA. So he's going to share some closing thoughts with us. Mike, the stage is yours. <laughs> thank you. Uh, just bear with me, everyone. I know I stand between you and uh, wrapping up the symposium. But I do want to take the opportunity to thank you, the audience that's in the room, as well as the audience that's online. Uh, when we started this event, I told you about uh, the Office of Pharmaceutical Quality's strategic priorities. And if you remember, there were four of them. It was basically to collaborate, innovate, communicate, as well as to engage. And it's amazing that we've engaged and communicated with uh, thousands, literally thousands of people across the globe. It's one of the amazing things about doing these symposiums with SBIA. I've personally been here the whole time. I've spent the two days here from start to finish. And I hope uh, you, as, uh, you, know, you feel the same way I do in terms of this symposium being both interesting and meaningful. I was talking to one of the attendees before he left today. And he told me he left, and these are his exact words, he left Richard today than when he came in. And it was amazing the term that he used um, because there's a lot of rich data and a lot of rich information that was shared over the last two days. So over these last two days, we had a session on our quality assessment process, including the manufacturing assessment of process and facilities and their relation to inspections. We've heard from CEDAR's Deputy Center Director, Dr. Patrizia Cavazzone, who explained the multitude of tools that the FDA needs to use to regulate quality beyond just inspection and application assessment. And we've also had a session on quality beyond application approval as well. Today we had a session about the FDA's commitment to spur the development of innovative technologies in both drug design as well as drug manufacture, or drug product manufacture. It's very important that we advance the level of technology that we use in pharmaceutical manufacturing industry to catch up with other industries as well and prepare for the next generation of the so-called industry as well as pharma 4.0. We've also heard about the latest developments related to biotech products, which were very stimulating discussions and a good exchange of information, as well as those related to biosimilars, which are a rapidly growing class of drugs for which we've approved in a record 11 applications over the last fiscal year. Of course, we just finished with a hot topic, which obviously all of you are well aware of, uh, which is the transition of certain peptide products to BLAs 
and how we're preparing for the quality assessment of those applications. I'd like to quickly thank the staff in OPQ. That really was the ones that, the, the horsepower behind all of this symposium. Those are the ones that deserve the um, uh, accolades and the credit for really making this a successful um, uh, a symposium for us, as well as thanking those across CEDAR for making this event uh, possible for us. A special thanks to uh, Captain Brenda Stada, start, uh, sorry, Stoddard, as well as Jeff Kelly, and everyone that supports SBIA in running the symposium. You always do, and I've been involved in several of these. An amazing job in really making this go very smoothly and very elegant, eloquently. Most importantly, thank you in the audience for participating. Um, you've taken one more step in joining us in the commitment to quality in the name of patients as well as consumers. And let's continue working together to give them, the patients and consumers, confidence in their next dose of medicines. So with that, I'd like to end the symposium and again say thank you and, self, and uh, safe travels to those of you that will be traveling home later today. Take care and be well. Thank you.